This is Leonard Rosenfeld. Yeah. Okay. Are we on, Doc? Yes, we're on. Oh, okay. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Well, what shall I say? This is the studio I have lived in since around 1958. Shall we Will just... the camera pick up my voice? Yes. Well, by the tape, I should say. Yeah. Um, come over here and give the uh, people a look at how pretty it is out the window. See, the trees are just beginning to come out. They're, they're blossoming. The buds have exploded. And the, the block is really lovely, you know, without the, the whores, without the hookers and the pimps, which I had here for about eight or nine years. I would, it was very bad. Now with the pimps and hookers on, the, the block is pretty. It's a, pl a pleasure to walk down, to walk out in the morning, take a walk, walk down the block. It's lovely, as you can see. And it's kept pretty clean. You know, this is the borderline, Doc between the Lower East Side and Little Italy in Chinatown. Like this is the other side of the tracks. This is the Lower East Side. This is the other side of the tracks to, or I should say from Little Italy and Chinatown. Once you cross Forsyth Christie Street here, oh, this is uh, not Eleanor Roosevelt, or the other Roosevelt, the sister. I forgot her name. This park is named Roosevelt Park. I forgot her first name. Eleanor's sister. Yeah. Or, or daughter, I don't know, but this park was named that. And it is a beautiful park. It's it's being repaired now. And I guess they're going to uh, gentrify the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But I'm five minutes out of, of Chinatown, two minutes out of Little Italy. It's very convenient. This is the Black Hooker. One of my, uh, I did a lot of watercolors and wash of hookers, pimps. This one here, it's funny to have a little angel hanging here, isn't it? There, the Black Hooker. <laughs> interesting contrast. But it's even more of an interesting contrast to this one which is uh, a hooker with, well, I don't do the John, I do the car. The John is always in, inevitably in the car. But this might be, these eyes and this head might be what is behind the window of the car. I haven't figured it out, even though I did it. It's, it's either the, a pimp watching what she's doing. It's a pimp watching what she's doing, or it's, uh, or it's uh, the John inside the car, whichever you uh, wish to have it, I think. And this is a little honey cup. You want to take it, this into consideration. I brought it back from Mexico last summer. It's beautiful. Reminds me a little of a Rodin. Isn't it gorgeous? It's a mask. It's a spirit. It's a spirit. A mask and a spirit. Strictly a uh, person of routine. I'm involved with routines. Uh, I really wanted to do start in the morning so I could show you the whole routine. How I get up. I get up around seven, between seven seven thirty. By about eight oh six, at the time of the uh, when, when the breakfast symphony goes on, I am sitting with a cup of coffee in my chair here. 
considering what I did the day before. And what I'm going to do today. You think the... Uh, you see, I, I sit here, I have coffee for about 20 minutes to a half hour. Coffee and a piece of pastry. And I look it over. This one is one I just finished called White Jew. This is the chair you sit in. Yeah, right. I'll sit in it. Yeah. And this is the view you have. Yeah. Well, actually, I did. This is not the last one. This is really the last one. This one called Cartoon. But this was interesting for me because someone had given me the talus that I used in, in the piece about 10 years ago for a piece, but I never used it. And I finally found a use for it. And uh, I, it's at the picture, the piece is really a failure because in a sense, I like it. It's a failure that I like. Because what I wanted to do was get the wire really mixed in with the talus and get a very disheveled, almost soutine, Chaim soutine type of look about it, and I, I couldn't do it. It was just too much for me. I got overpowered. But you see, I put a paintbrush. This is actually, the wire here is, is a hand. This is a blue paintbrush. I painted blue. And I put a, a yarmulke made out of my black wire, my black uh, electric cord or electric wire, which I have been using in all my work for the past five or six years. The hand is at the bottom? Yeah, it's actually holding the talus and holding the paintbrush at the same time. Yeah. In other words, it's your hand. Yeah. Well, if, if it's me, if it's a picture of me, it's my hand. If it, <laughs> I guess, I don't know, it's, it's like the Jew is a painter or the painter is a Jew, I don't know. I never did anything like this. Excuse me for a moment, Doc. The doorbell. And it has just been turned back on. Let's, let's try it. Great. I have the water back. So, uh, I don't know if this will be in the show uh, or not. You should know I'm having, uh, you know I'm having an exhibition. Yeah, a solo show uh, at Central Falls on uh, May 13th. 1986. Right, 1986. And uh, this might be a little too much for them. I don't know if their clientele, if they think their clientele can handle this piece, especially with the title White Jew. I don't know. But I kind of like it. I wouldn't mind it in the show. That's May 13th, 1986 to June 15th. 1986. June 15th, right. Long time. And when you consider the place is open on weekends, Gives me about a six week show. It's unreal. Now, this, I don't know what this is exactly. I, I didn't know whether to call this one out of Africa because this reminds me of a little black figure with eyes, mouth. Here, I got a soutine like element, which I tried to. It's very difficult to really mix up the wire and, and like, I, like I would like to do. Things seem to solidify themselves instead for me, you know. You know, here's like a mask. I made this out of a, a, a sock, an argyle stocking. Uh, 
nose, mouth, mouth, sad, mouth, smiling, two mouths. This seems to be two red feet, some kind of a neck, necklace or uh, neck piece that you see them wearing in Africa sometimes. And this, I don't know what this was, it reminded me of a snake, actually, uh, a man, a little man, holding, I don't know what he was holding, really. Uh, I, at first I, I thought maybe it was a snake. I don't know what I intended. What I really wanted, what I did intend, really, was to fill up this space. Because it, usually the space, like the space here doesn't bother me. You see? And here, this sort of makes a difference. It, it's a little, this is a little too symmetrical, but this space definitely needed something. I put this in this little black figure's hand. You know, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I don't mind. So that gave me another piece, and whether, whether she could take this for the show. The, the, the director of the gallery is June Robinson, by the way, and she's very sharp, she's interesting. She likes the work. That's the kit. Oh yeah, that's that's the uh, my painting racks. You're on my painting racks. Yeah. Oh, it's chilly. Uh, it's a little chilly. Isn't it interesting how this? Uh, I hope it warms up this afternoon. See my flowers have died. They did that. I have beautiful little rose here. I just, I got these flowers. Uh, you know, it's funny, but uh, I have gotten flowers at openings. I opened in Mokotov Gallery at 7:35 each night. I opened in a large group show on uh, uh, last week, it, it, which will be on through the whole month of May, by the way. And it's interesting that. Uh, I received the rose from a, a lovely young lady, and I received this from another uh, dandelion from another lady. And they were so fresh, so beautiful. This makes a good still life. Yeah, doesn't it? It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Even though they're faded away, you could really do something with it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Every image has its place. Every yeah. level has its place. This That's could be a painting in itself. Yeah. Painting whether they're fresh or withered away. The artist usually the artist usually makes decorations or even places things in such an artistic manner. Yeah, like for some reason I have to have this bowl here. I have to have this plate with the bananas. I keep the wine here. <laughs> and this place I keep clean to eat, you know. It's interesting. You're right, and I, I'm very, very aware all the time of uh, placement. Mm -hmm. What can you say about this over here? Well, this is a series I was doing before I went to these two wire pieces. Uh, I found this wallpaper on Grand Street, and I don't know if I could use it or not. You know, I. I uh, it's a full uh, row. I found two full rows of wallpaper, two different. They're both different. This is one of them. It has an Art Deco design in it, as you can see. And I started to do... I had cowboys and Indians on my mind. I, I don't know why. I just felt like doing... I, I, I think possibly it had, had to do with returning to uh, when I was a kid, when I used to collect cowboy and Indian tickets. It was like a, a real fetish or fad in that. They used to keep them in cheese boxes. Hundreds, hundreds, sometimes thousands of tickets. Today, I think they sell them. Uh, you know, so this as, mask as, is as what? memorabilia. This is called my mother as a Russian squaw. <laughs> so that's your mother? Well, my mother didn't look like that. She, My mother was Russian. Yeah. She didn't have brown skin. 
or lips this big. She did have a schnoz like this, though. Kind of a more a, a, a nice, juicy Russian nose, you know. It had quality on nose. It was like a fruit. And she did have brown eyes, not blue eyes. But it has the feel of my mother. There's some, that's why I called it my mother as a Russian squaw. And I think the Indians usually wore some kind of bone structure. You can see the feathers. It has intensity. I like this one. I don't get tired of it. I keep it up. Yeah. Well, a great art is supposed to be never boring. So you don't get bored by this. Well, there could be something to that. Uh, I think everything in life gets dull. Everything in life gets dull? Yeah, I think everything gets dull, or worn out a little bit, or worn out a lot. Does art get dull? I think so. Music? I, well, you take a, a single piece. I think looking at a single piece too much, like anything else excessively, might, it might become dull, or run a, a not so interesting, you know? Yeah. Then maybe you have to take it down for a while, or put up something else and then bring it back, you know? But isn't it also true that you can always find something new and interesting in a good piece? I think that's true, too. I think that's true, yes. If, if you're really... There are some days when your mind really flows freely. Your, your mind is open. And uh, when your mind is open... Like, I love to be in a museum or a gallery when my mind is open. I know it's open because I, I am looking for something in almost everything I look at. Something I might, even at first glance, uh, consider dumb or leaving open. I try to find, locate what the artist is doing. See? And, and usually if my mind is open, I find something. But, but in, in a really beautiful piece, I think you, you always do. You, if you put a, uh, buy a piece or acquire a piece and put it in your house, I think you will always find something in it. You will look, one day you'll just be sitting and musing or looking into space or looking at it and suddenly see something you hadn't seen before. You mean even if it isn't good? Well, maybe even if it isn't good, yes. I don't know. Would you like to see some more of these pieces I did on the wallpaper? Yeah. Uh, let me uh, take this down. Because I did some interesting pieces, some series. I always have the music. Tell me something of your mother. Well, she came from Russia when she was about 15 years old. Yeah. As far as she, I can, uh, I can remember, I think she said the boat, they were in a tremendous storm on the way home. And the boat, they had the feeling the boat was going to sink, but somehow it made it mm -hmm. to Ellis Island, you know? And, you know, my mother uh, learned to speak perfect English, perfect English, without you, you wouldn't think she was anything but an American. And I think I got my talent from my mother. I used to think it was my father, because my father always did caricature. Wherever he was in a room with people, he'd be scribbling frantically on a pad, doing people. He did it all his life. I used to watch him, but then I realized later on that there was a sensitivity in my mother that I think I acquired. 
an artistic sensitivity. My mother sang, although she was uh, Jewish, she sang in a choir in a church in Kiev. Well, talent is a love for the work, for art. You think she gave you a love for it? Or were you born with it? And uh, she reflected it in some way, more than your father. But you're saying both your father, parents had artistic oh, sensibilities. Yeah, they, they both did, but I, I, my mother never drew, really, you know? She was sort of ashamed to, but I, I saw a drawing of hers. Uh, she finally did a drawing. She once did me while I was sitting and eating dinner. She picked up a crayon, and I was uh, surprised. I was sort of shocked at the sensitivity of the drawing of the line. And it, it was beyond caricature, it was beyond what my father used to do. Like there was nothing really, my father used to work very quickly and, and do comic, represent very comic images on a piece of paper of people. But the, you know, I, I never thought of them as sensitive. But there was a super sensitivity about this thing my mother had done. The way she shaded my face and, and uh, did my hair and the eyes, and it had a, a beautiful furtive quality about it. And, uh, then I realized that I, I have that quality in my art, and, and I changed my whole idea. I realized that I, I, I felt that I got it out of my mother. Well, I don't know the answer to your question specifically. I don't know that I was born with it, got it from my mother. My father. And evidently, it comes out of my parents. I always did draw. I, I drew from the in the public school. In fact, I used to draw. I neglected all my work. You know, I used to get terrible, terrible grades. Good afternoon, welcome. I didn't discover reading till I was in about the eighth grade. You know, I, they used to catch me drawing at the desk all the time. Corner, we'll have music by Curtis, Blank, and Bernstein, and Ducat. Did you get good grades in art? I got good grades in art, yeah. I, I was always sort of a favorite of the art you know. But I never won any real prizes, you know. I, I did get something, I'll never forget, my art teacher in the sixth or seventh grade presented me with a beautiful set of pastels. I'll never forget that, a box with layers of pastels that she personally gave to me. I mean, she didn't give it to anyone else, she just gave it to me. I didn't win any prizes, though, like they used to have these art prizes at a graduation or sometimes the end of the year, right, for some reason. I don't know what to make of it, though. But formal work, I've been working formally, I guess, for about 25 years, maybe more or less, you know, más o menos, 25 years or so. I consider myself a hero. What's your definition of a hero? A hero is... Well, a hero can be many things. There's a hero in war, but I'm not really talking about. It. Maybe I am talking about that kind of. This is a war. This art, art racket is kind of a war. You know, the art business, making art. This, I, I endure a battle here every day with a problem a minute. And what makes you a hero? You go above and beyond the call of duty. Is that what a hero is? No, well, it could have, it could relate to that. Well, for instance, I, I am involved in something that apparently brings, doesn't bring me remuneration, but I keep doing it day after day. Is that heroic effort? I think, I think that is something heroic about that. The fact that while the whole world is running pell-mell trying to acquire money, while well, here I am trying to acquire something, something else. I'm accumulating. I know I'm acquiring paintings. I'm accumulating. Look at this. I have about 300 paintings rolled up on top of my closet, aside from what I have in my racks here. 
But there is, I think there's something heroic about staying at it no matter what. The, the call an obsession. Uh, no matter what you call it, though, whether it's an obsession, I think I'm a hero because I stayed with it in the face of everything, in the face of poverty. I mean poverty in the face of not having money, uh, which I still don't have, and probably well, never will have. Well, is Van Gogh a hero? He Van committed suicide. Gogh was absolutely a hero. But he committed suicide. He didn't stay with it. Well, in a sense, uh, although he stayed with it as long as he stayed with it, according to his temperament, according to his life. I mean, his life was more intense than mine. I don't live with the intensity Van Gogh lived. I live in the normal everyday life. I have a routine. I get up in the morning, I make breakfast at exactly the same time. I go to work exactly the same time. I knock, out, knock off for lunch about 12 o'clock every day. Sit down to have lunch and turn on the boob tube to watch the, the news while I'm having lunch. I have a routine here. I, my life doesn't doesn't have the ups and downs of a Vincent Van Gogh. I'm not waiting for some character to come and live with me. Uh, I don't have any ideas about someone sharing coming here to live with me, who I'm going to share my painting with, and and then uh, go crazy and cut off an organ. You know, it's, I'm nowhere near that. But what makes your life heroic? My, what makes it heroic is the fact that I have gone, I'm an outlaw. I've gone against what the rest of society is doing, basically. Basically speaking, everyone is out every day to make money. I'm not out every day to make money, I'm out every day to paint a picture. I mean, it could bring me money, it has brought me some money. Well, are you saying that everybody who does something full-time without um, interest in um, pecuniary motives uh, is a hero? I think a person who does something without uh, trying to make money at it and does it with, uh, obsessively from day to day because he has a love for it or an obsession with it, whatever that obsession might be. Call it love, call it... Um, I don't know. Uh, I think there's something heroic about that. I mean, I don't think a hero is just somebody who finds himself on a battlefield with soldiers and uh, suddenly is in a position to do something what we call heroic, like kill a bunch of people in order to save a bunch of comrades, or to save a comrade. I don't think that's the only definition of a hero. In fact, that has its ins and outs, too. You know, some, Sometimes I think a, a hero on the battlefield is made because of the circumstances, you think, rather than because he intended to do it. You see? I, I think you can, a hero can probably be many things. I think a, an artist who goes at it from day to day, whether it be a writer, a painter, a music maker, what have you, it, and even if there is no remuneration in sight, I think that is a hero. Yes. What do you think? Against all odds, then. Well, it is against all odds in a way, uh, in, in the sense that uh, people are always looking at you like, first of all, you're strange, you're an artist, especially in this country although it's becoming more frequent in this country and, and artists are not that strange and maybe that's wearing off a little uh, you're an oddball as an artist you know and you do look like an oddball you usually have a pair of pants with paint on it you know somewhere uh, you're not that formal about the way you dress you know you're liable to wear anything I think so. But usually, um, the tragedy of life is when the hero uh, or the artist, I, I think of the heroes as the artist who 
but doesn't get what he should deserve. Well, that's the artist. Um, he makes heroic efforts, tremendous efforts, mm. and may not accomplish anything, but he does it anyway. Mm. That's and, what uh, But of course, if you're built that way, you have no choice. So uh, in, in the battlefield, a hero is somebody who sees formidable odds, goes after it anyway, and succeeds. You wouldn't say that somebody who failed was a hero, would you? Even though, or only those who succeed. Was Van Gogh a hero? Van Gogh was a hero. No matter whether he succeeded or not. Well. An unsung or unknown well, hero? He's a sung hero. Today, after he was dead, he became uh, well known throughout the art world, and not only the art world, the entire world. I, I don't think. Uh, I think people know Van, the name Van Gogh everywhere in the world today, basically speaking. Is there anyone that doesn't know the name Van Gogh? Well, I'm sure there are African natives or well, South American in our, natives in our, in our or, culture, in our or even culture. here Midwesterners. In our culture, I think everybody knows in the, in the Western Hemisphere, in Europe. I mean, they have a, in, in Holland, they have a you know, couple of museums uh, exclusively devoted to Van They have the Van the Van Hoch Museum uh, shows four, four or five fl uh, floors of Van you know? uh, Vincent is my hero, let me put it that way. Uh, he's my favorite painter. He's my favorite uh, uh, personality, my favorite painter in the art world, in the history of the world. There was something appealing to him about me. Uh, uh, well, don't you think it's amazing that he painted 800 pictures in a span of 10 years? I mean, that the gesture alone, this, this is heroic. This is unbelievable. Whether he made money or at, or at it or not in his own time, you know? Uh, I think an artist who makes money is a hero too. Uh, just because an artist uh, scores with his work in the financial world doesn't uh, world doesn't make him less of a hero. Yeah, Shakespeare made money. I don't know whether it was on his plays or uh, whether he sold beer at the uh, play. That's he's reputed to have made most of his money as the in running the beer concession. Look, there's something about that tribe of people that doesn't just go for money, that goes for something in this world other than just accumulating money. Of course, there's a whole tribe of people that has no choice but to try to, they, they don't have any money. And they, they make money just to survive, you know? Not to accumulate money so much, but to survive each day. People with families, people alone. Well, what is the goal of, uh... Van Gogh's art, and what is your goal? Is there a goal, or just... One minute, Doctor. Music is too loud. Let me put some pieces up. Okay. See what we've got here, Doc. I did a very... Did your mother encourage you in art? No. Did she discourage you? My mother encouraged me with a number of things. To dress. My mother used to say, when you go for a job, wear a top suit and a tie, and dress good, and you'll get the job. My mother was basic. She didn't really encourage me. She, she never objected. She wasn't the type of mother that objected to what I wanted to do. She didn't expect me to be a doctor or a lawyer or the rest of it. She, uh, she never objected to the fact that I was interested in painting. And your father? Well, my father, I didn't know that well. I mean, my father died when I was 14 or 15. I just, uh, my father was a very, very easygoing man. Never pushed me into anything. You know, I never had that problem. 
What did he die of? My father died of a, I guess he died of a heart attack when he was about 41 years old. Wow. Yeah, he died one morning at dawn. It was terrible. 